Whether it's a wizard launching a fireball or a cleric bringing someone back from the brink of death, magic is a force that weaves its way through the worlds of D&D. Magic is one of the elements that helps make fantasy its own genre, and it is a tool that can alter the reality around the characters for the better or worse. In today's episode, we'll be talking about how to harness magic, the rules around applying it within the game, and we'll begin filling out some of the information on the third page of your character sheet, if you decided to make a spellcasting class. This is Magic and Spellcasting. In the worlds of D&D, magic has rules. In a lore perspective, people have discovered what those rules are, and they have been put to use by magic users to create spells. Spells are manifestations of magical power that can cause damage, heal the injured, remove or cause conditions, and even bring back the dead. Spells range in level from 0 to 9, though we call the level 0 spells cantrips. The higher the level of the spell, the more powerful the effect they create but it also requires a higher level spellcaster to be able to use these higher level spells. Spell level does not correspond with your character's level, and most often you will find a character will need to be 17th level in order to cast 9th level spells. In order for a spellcaster to be able to cast a spell, the player's handbook says he or she must have the spell firmly fixed in mind. We can think of this as equipping a mental roster of spells that your character can draw from. After equipping a roster of spells, some classes such as bards and sorcerers will always have the same spells prepared from day to day. These are referred to as known spells. Other classes are able to change this mental roster of spells when they start a new day, as wizards and clerics can do. These are referred to as prepared spells. Classes with prepared spells can choose to substitute certain spells on their mental roster with others from a wider list but they must go through a preparation ritual as described in their class's spellcasting feature. It will be important to read up on how your class prepares their spells, as they all have their own flavor. Clerics pray to their deity for a period in the morning while they prepare their spells, while wizards study their spellbooks and go through a period of mental memorization of their incantations. If you chose a class that uses known spells, don't worry if you find out you have a spell that you don't like or use very often. Most classes with known spells give you the opportunity to switch out at least one spell when you level up. Regardless of how many spells a character knows or is able to prepare, there are only a certain amount of spells that a character can cast in a day before they need to rest. This is shown through spell slots. When we were choosing our character's class, I mentioned that the right side of your class table was relevant to spellcasting. This is where you will see your spell slots, if your class has any. In each spellcaster's class table, it lists the number of spell slots that a character has at each level, as well as the level of those slots. For the cleric that we created in this series, looking at their class table, we can see that a first level cleric has two first level spell slots. The use of these spell slots reflects the mental and physical taxation that spellcasting has on an individual. Every magical effect created has an equivalent cost on your character's body and mind. When a character casts a spell, they must expend a spell slot of that spell's level or higher, subtracting it from your current number of spell slots of that level. You are never able to cast a spell using a spell slot of a level lower than the spell you're trying to cast. For example, you cannot cast a 3rd level fly spell using a 2nd level spell slot. You must use a 3rd level spell slot or higher. If you do cast a spell using a spell slot of a higher level, for that casting, the spell becomes the level of the spell slot that is being used. If you cast a 1st level magic missile using a 2nd level spell slot, it will instead become a 2nd level magic missile. Some spells, such as Magic Missile and Cure Wounds, become more powerful when used with a higher spell slot. This doesn't apply to every spell, but the spell will say if it becomes more powerful when you use a higher spell slot in its description. Though this isn't in the player's handbook, this is often called upcasting. Finishing a long rest will replenish any spell slots that you have used during your adventuring day. 
Earlier, I mentioned that level 0 spells are called cantrips. These are spells that are so simple that they become ingrained in the mind of a spellcaster through repeated casting of the spell. They become second nature. In addition to spell slots, our class table will tell us how many cantrips our character knows. In the case of our cleric, we will know three cantrips at first level. Cantrips are like known spells. Once you've chosen them, you will always have those cantrips prepared every day moving forward. But on the plus side, they require no spell slots to cast. Some cantrips increase in power as your character reaches higher levels, and will say so in the spell's description. Now that we know what spells and spell slots are, what is involved with casting a spell? To help you understand that, we're going to be going over the template of spell info blocks. In these spell info blocks, you will find that all spells will have a name, level, school of magic, casting time, range, components, duration, and a description for the spell. Name and level are both simple to understand. Each spell has a unique name, and the level is a minimum level of spell slot required to cast it. I'm not going to touch much on the schools of magic in this video, but briefly put, these are categorizations that help give us an idea as to what a group of spells do, such as the School of Illusion governing spells that typically create effects useful for deception and the creation of illusions. You can read about the Schools of Magic on page 203 of the Player's Handbook or page 84 of the Basic Rules. The casting time of a spell is how long it takes to cast a spell, and most spells will have a casting time of one action. However, some spells can have a casting time of a bonus action, reaction, or a longer period of time. Spells that require your bonus action to cast are incredibly swift. However, if you decide you also want to cast a spell with your action, that spell must be a cantrip. Spells that can be cast as a reaction are spells that can be used in response to some event, even if it's not your turn. The details about when you can use a reaction spell are mentioned in the description of that spell. If you're casting a spell that has a longer casting time, it will tell you the exact time it takes to cast, and it can be minutes or even hours. If you cast a spell with a longer casting time than one action during battle, you will need to use your action each turn casting the spell. Keep in mind that a round is 6 seconds, so every 1 minute of casting is 10 rounds of combat. You will also need to maintain concentration on the spell while casting it. We'll go over this in more detail when we get to duration. If concentration is broken while you're casting the spell, the spell fails, but you don't lose the spell slot. If you want to try casting it again, you will need to start over. Some spells can also be considered rituals, and these are a type of spell with longer casting times. You'll be able to identify this by the tag saying Ritual in parentheses beneath the name of the spell. You can choose to cast the spell as normal using a spell slot, or to cast it as a ritual. If you choose to cast the spell as a ritual, you can cast it without using a spell slot. But in order to do so, you must increase the casting time of the spell by 10 minutes. If the spell you were casting had a casting time of one action, as a ritual, it would have a casting time of 10 minutes and one action, or 6 seconds. Since a spell cast as a ritual doesn't use a spell slot, that means that a ritual cannot be upcast. In order to perform ritual casting, the character's class must have a class feature that allows them to cast ritual spells, as the cleric and druid do. The spell must also be in the character's prepared list of spells for that day, unless a class's ritual feature says otherwise. Now let's talk about the range of spells. Any target for the spells you cast needs to be within range of the spell. Most spells will have their range written in feet. If a spell has a range of touch, this means that you need to physically touch the target, and this can include yourself. If the spell has a range of self, this means that the spell can only target the individual casting the spell. Some spells with a range of self will create an area of effect meaning that the spell targets an area and those within it instead of individual targets. The spell Burning Hands is such an example. The reason a spell such as this would have a range of self is to say the spell originates from the caster. Area of effect spells come in different shapes, 
lines, cones, cubes, spheres, and cylinders. For the specifics of these shapes and their origin points, that info can be found on page 204 of the Player's Handbook, or pages 84 to 85 of the Basic Rules. Once cast, the effects of a spell aren't limited by the range unless a spell's description says otherwise. Going back to the example of the Burning Hand spell, it casts its spell in a cone of fire. However, it can spread to nearby vegetation, having unintended consequences if we're not responsible. Let's move on to components. In pop culture, many wizards we've seen in movies have to say magic words, make hand gestures, or have certain ingredients to make their spells work. This is also the case for magic in D&D, and these elements are called components. There are three types of components, verbal, somatic, and material. If a spell requires one or more of these components, and a caster isn't able to meet the requirement for some reason, the spell cannot be cast. Verbal components are typically words said as part of a spell. If a character is gagged, or somehow finds themselves in a place where noise is unable to exist, the spell cannot be cast. Somatic components are intricate hand movements, and a caster must have at least one hand free in order to be able to perform these gestures. Material components are the objects used to cast the spell. The particular objects required will be written in parentheses next to the components section. Instead of having these specific items, a caster can use a component pouch or spellcasting focus instead. The component pouch is a bag filled with all kinds of basic magical ingredients, and it's assumed many material components are within the pouch. A spellcasting focus is an item that helps channel magical energies, such as a wand or staff. Depending on your class, the spellcasting focuses available to you may be different, such as a sprig of mistletoe for a druid, or in the case of the cleric we created, a holy symbol in the form of an amulet. Though the component pouch and spellcasting focuses can replace most material components, if a spell lists an item that has a cost value along with it, they must have that specific item before they are able to cast the spell. For example, to cast the Identify spell, a person would need a pearl worth at least 100 gold pieces, even if they had a component pouch or spellcasting focus. Sometimes a spell will say that an item is consumed by the casting of the spell. This means that the item is gone after the casting of the spell, and the caster will need to acquire more of that item if they want to cast the spell again. The caster will need to have a free hand to deal with the material components, but it can be the same hand that is performing the somatic components. Moving on to the duration of a spell, this is how long the effects of a spell remain active. Some spells will only be active for an instant, while others can have effects that last for years. This will be listed in the spell's duration. If a spell has a duration of instantaneous, that means that the effect takes place and then ends immediately on the same turn that the spell was cast. If a spell lasts longer than that, it might say that the spell requires you to maintain concentration. Losing concentration will cause the spell to end prematurely. If a spell requires concentration, that will be listed in the duration entry, as well as the maximum duration that you can continue concentrating on that spell. A caster can end their concentration on a spell at any time, no action required to do so. While concentrating on a spell, you can move around, attack, and even cast other spells. However, there are things that can break your concentration. If you cast a second spell that requires concentration, you lose concentration on the first spell. You cannot concentrate on two spells at the same time. If you take damage while concentrating on a spell, you must make a constitution saving throw in order to maintain your focus. The DC of the saving throw equals 10 or half the damage taken, whichever is higher. If you take damage from multiple sources, you will need to make the constitution saving throw against each source of damage. Lastly, if you are incapacitated or killed, you automatically lose concentration on any magical effects you were focusing on. Now, you are armed with the knowledge necessary to begin casting magic. At this point, just be sure to read the description of the spells you're choosing to see what their actual effects are. The spell's name will give some indication, but you may find that some spells are limited in what they can actually do. Or a spell might be more powerful than you initially thought. Before you go choosing your spells, it's important to know that your class determines which spells you're allowed to choose. 
unfortunately, you don't get access to every spell in the game. You can find your list of spell options starting on page 207 of the Player's Handbook or page 86 of the Basic Rules. The class spell lists are sorted in alphabetical order, so continue flipping through until you find your class. Once you get to your class spell list, you should see that the spells are divided into groups by level and then even further into alphabetical order. If you're not sure as to how many spells you get access to, refer to your class's spellcasting feature, going to the subheadings on Preparing Spells or Spells Known. You now know where you can find your class's spell list, and some of the spells on those lists have attack applications. So let's talk about how to use the dangerous ones before we accidentally set our clothes on fire. Similar to attacking with a weapon, spells also make attack rolls. When you roll the d20, you add your spell casting bonus. This bonus can be calculated by adding your proficiency bonus and your class's spell casting ability modifier together. If you're a bard, sorcerer, or warlock, this will be your charisma modifier. For clerics and druids, it will be your wisdom modifier. And for wizards, it will be your intelligence modifier. Unlike ranged weapons, ranged spell attacks don't have a long range. You can attack any target within your range, but you cannot go beyond that. Some spells, instead of being about accuracy, can force your target to make a saving throw. This will force your target to try and resist an effect or dodge out of the way of an area of effect spell. The target will need to make a saving throw based on one of their ability scores, and the spell's description will tell you which ability. Their saving throw will be contested by your own spell save DC. Your spell save DC is the lowest number your target has to get after rolling the d20 and adding the appropriate modifiers in order to resist the effect, or at least resist most of the spell's effects. Your spell save DC is calculated with the following formula. 8 plus proficiency bonus plus spell casting ability modifier. Some spells will still do something even if your target succeeds on the saving throw, so be sure to read the spell's description. Having the ability to use magic can make characters quite powerful and prepared for most situations, especially if a character has the effects of multiple spells active on them at the same time. The effects of different spells can stack on the same target. However, multiple castings of the same spell on a target won't stack. If multiple castings of the same spell are used on a single character, only the casting that provided the greatest bonus will apply. I'm going to use the Aid spell as an example. It's a spell that increases a character's hit points by 5 for the spell's duration. If two characters cast Aid on the same character, the spell will increase their hit points by 5. It won't cause the buff to become 10 just because it was cast twice. As for spells that grant temporary hit points, they are treated a little differently. If you want a recap on how temporary hit points work, we talked about that topic in our episode about combat. So, you now know the ways of magic, but the third page of our character sheet isn't yet filled out. We'll do a quick recap of everything we talked about in this episode while we fill out our spellcasting page. At the top of the page, we need to fill in our spellcasting class, spellcasting ability, spell save DC, and spell attack bonus. In my case, my character's class is cleric. Their spellcasting ability I can find in the description of my class's spellcasting feature, and there I learned that it's wisdom. To calculate our spell save DC, the formula is 8 plus proficiency bonus plus spellcasting ability modifier. I know that my spellcasting ability is wisdom, so going to the first page of my character sheet and looking at wisdom, I can see that my modifier is plus 3. On that same page, I can also see my proficiency bonus is plus 2. So, plugging these numbers into the formula, my spell save DC is 13. My spell attack bonus is the same formula except without the 8. So, if we subtract 8 from our spell save DC, that will give us my spell attack bonus of plus 5. This is the number I will add to d20 rolls when I attack using spells. The next thing we should do is determine our number of spell slots. Looking at our class table, we go down to our character's level, which is first level, and see how many spell slots are in that row. I can see that our cleric only has two first level spell slots. Going back to the third page of our character sheet, 
we can see that we have a bunch of sections in the main body. Each section is associated with a spell level. Because I know I only have two first level spell slots, I'm going to find the section for first level spells. And where it says slots total, I'm going to enter the number two. Now when we get to the game, I won't erase that number. Instead, I'll put a tick in the slots expended box anytime I use a first level spell. I know that there should only ever be two ticks here, because that's my spell slot total. And I can erase these ticks when our characters wake up after a long rest. With our spell slots set, let's choose some cantrips. Again, your class table will tell you how many cantrips your character will have at their level. As you level up, there will be times when you can get more cantrips. Looking at the table, our cleric will get to choose three cantrips at first level. If I go to my cleric spell list on page 207 of the player's handbook, or page 86 of the basic rules, I can see that I have a few options. I'm going to choose the Light, Sacred Flame, and Spare the Dying cantrips, and write those on my character sheet. I choose the Light cantrip because it can be a magical source of light, so there's some utility there. The Sacred Flame cantrip is a cantrip that deals damage, and Spare the Dying is useful for stabilizing any characters that fall to zero hit points. The last thing you'll need to do is choose your higher level spells. As a cleric, we use prepared spells. This means we can choose from any spells of a level that we also have spell slots for. This means because we only have first level spell slots, we can only choose first level spells. So I'm going to write all the cleric's first level spells on the character sheet in the first level section. Our cleric can prepare different spells from the cleric spell list at the start of each day. Looking at the cleric spellcasting feature, I can see the number of spells we can prepare per day is equal to our cleric's level plus our spellcasting ability modifier. I know my spellcasting ability is wisdom, and my wisdom modifier is plus three, and my cleric's level is one, so I can prepare four spells each day. To mark which spells I'm preparing from the list, I'll put a mark in the circle to the left of the spell. When the next in-game day comes, I can erase the marks and change which spells I prepare, or I can just keep the same ones. If you chose Druid as your class, you will choose your higher level spells in a similar manner. The class of Wizard also prepares their spells in a similar fashion, but with a slight variation, so if you've chosen Wizard, be sure to read your description. If the class you've chosen to play is a Bard, Sorcerer, or Warlock, you will instead have known spells, and your method of preparation is going to be different. Your class table will have a column that says Spells Known, and this is the number of spells that you get to choose. Like my cleric, you can only choose spells of a level that you also have spell slots for, which should only be first level spells. Once you choose your known spells, you will have those same spells day after day, just like your cantrips. Once you level up, however, you can choose to change a spell you know for a different one that you are eligible to choose. So once you get second level spell slots, you can swap a first level spell for a second level spell. Be sure to reference your class table when you level up as well. It will tell you when you learn an additional spell. Spellcasting is quite varied amongst the classes, and this is why it's important for you to read the details of your class's spellcasting feature. In fact, now that I'm reading the clerics, I see that they have the ritual casting feature, and so I should add that under my Features and Traits section on the first page of my character sheet. And with that, our character sheet is officially ready to use in a game. Congratulations on becoming a student of magic. Now that you are capable of using magic, try becoming familiar with more spells, reading the effects that they have, and considering situations that they could be useful. All of the spell info blocks can be found in alphabetical order starting on page 211 of the Player's Handbook or page 87 of the Basic Rules. And also congratulations on making it this far. Magic and spellcasting is one of the most difficult parts of the game to grasp. And now you should have a completed character sheet to mark this joyous occasion. In the next episode, we're going to be wrapping up this series. We're going to be talking about what it's like to sit down at a table with a D&D group and actually get ourselves ready to play a game of Dungeons & Dragons. Until then, be kind and play Dicely.